You promised your papa you would go to school. Oh yeah. L'adaptation de Pinocchio par Guillermo del Toro et Mark Gustafsson a été acclamée par la critique comme par le public. S'il s'agit avant tout d'un film en stop motion, Pinocchio a aussi bénéficié d'effets visuels. Nous avons pu en discuter avec le studio MPC lors du Pit Sanguin. I'm Aaron Weintraub, currently the Executive Visual Effects Supervisor at MPC Toronto, formerly of Mr. X, one of the co-founders of Mr. X back in 2001, kind of built up the company until uh, we kind of joined up with Technicolor in around 2015 and then MPC and now part of uh, Technicolor Creative Studios now. You worked uh, on Pinocchio, can you tell us how you get uh, involved in the show? We had done a lot of films, a lot of projects with uh, Guillermo del Toro from Mama and Pacific Rim through uh, The Strain and Shape of Water and Crimson Peak. You know, this was kind of the next one in, you know, slate of projects that he wanted to work on. He'd been working on it for a long time. They were doing it stop motion, and obviously they needed, uh, you know, a visual effects partner to handle the, the digital work that we wouldn't be able to complete in stop motion. And yeah, the discussions kind of just kept going from there. So how was the, the collaboration between uh, the studio and Guillermo del Toro and Mark Gustafsson with um, MPC, Netflix and the directors? This was Guillermo and Mark's project. So this is you know, a passion project from Guillermo who you know, hooked up with, with Mark and Shadow Machine and the animation studio in Portland that, that handled the stop motion. Netflix you know, was the, the supporter of it, uh, produced it and, and financed the Finance the production, but ultimately, you know, creative control was with Guillermo and Mark, and we were kind of hand in hand in them. You know, from the the initial story process, where you know we were involved in the kind of the story and the boarding stages, to you know determine what was going to go digital, what was going to be practical, what they were able to do. It just kind of went from there. We approached it like a like a regular film, you know, pre-production meetings and you know going storyboard by storyboard, shot by shot, um, figuring out what components were going to be handled practically and where we were going to go digital and what you know communication we needed to. You know, make that handover as seamless as possible. How um, involved were each of them um, in the production process? Were they very uh, hands-on and very detailed, or basically did they just trust you to do uh, everything? They're very, very hands-on. Um, I mean, it was a, it was a, just a, a huge, amazing collaboration with everyone. I mean, Mark is, you know, their day to day. He's a stop motion expert. Um, he was, you know, going set to set to set, advising, and the same with Guillermo would kind of look at the final product, look at the shots as they come out of dailies, and advise and, and make his notes or, you know, look at the blockings. Be like, no, we need to, you know, just emphasize this moment here and hit that beat there. But really, we, you know, in the in terms of the stop motion shooting, like the the animators were very trusted. Um, like once they be had that working relationship, the animators were the actors and they kind of let them run with a shot. Stop motion is really interesting, like to, to myself personally as a you know, filmmaker who's used to being on live action sets and just watching, you know, doing take after take to try, to try to get it right and hit the performance. In stop motion, you get one take, right? And they, they kind of, they plan it out meticulously, but when they finally go to shoot it, It's one shot, you know, it's one take straight through. And, you know, you can count on one hand the number of retakes that, you know, were ordered up because of, you know, performance issues or either they want to try something differently. But otherwise, it's like a single take at the exact length, usually, that it's going to be in the film, and they get it in the can. So, you know, it, it, there's a, a high level of trust there uh, that the animators kind of go off and they, they know what they're doing. They, you know, request feedback when they, when they need it. But really, um, There, there was, you know, everyone, everyone kind of trusted everyone to do their best work. How did the team decide what to do uh, using stop motion and what to do the digitally? You know, one of the, the, the mantras, I would say, uh, of how we approached this was, um, if we can shoot it practically, if, they, if there's a way to build this, we're going to do it practically. You know, they wanted very much a handcrafted feel. They didn't want to, you know, cheat, <laughs> let's say. All of the puppets, all the sets, you know, everything that they could build, they were going to do practically. It was really only when it came to the simulations. Uh, so the water, the fire, snow, rain, you know, all that kind of stuff that would just be impossible to do at, you know, a, a scale to shoot in, in stop motion that, you know, they came to, to us to, to handle digitally. Did you have a specific uh, visual references? I mean, the, the reference was, was everything they built. Um, like, you know, we were creating a world. So, you know, the, from the very beginning, the production designers knew, you know, what this world was, was supposed to look like and the, the kind of textures and materials that they wanted to build everything from. And really that was our, our jumping off point. And like, that was, that was the goal for us was that everything we made had to feel like it was made and thought of and you know, designed specifically to fit in with the world that, that had been created by, by everyone else. The fire simulations look very amazing because they look practical. How did you approach this effect? The fire actually came out of a practical test. So before we even started 
working on the fire digitally, Brian Hansen, who's the animation supervisor uh, in, in Portland at Shadow Machine, did a practical stop motion test where he took you know pieces of cheesecloth and the cheesecloth was kind of wrapped around you know armature wire and he built little you know flames and he animated it in stop motion. Uh, the the DP kind of lit it with. Um, this device we called a, a time machine, which was kind of a rotating disc of gels that you could motion control and time and repeat so that these, these flickering pieces of cloth would have, you know, a, a lighting fire feel to them. And, you know, we did one take and, you know, it had embers that were kind of pieces of cloth that were flown, floating up wires that had to be removed. And that was like the one test that they did practically of the fire. Everyone really liked it, but there was no way we could do it at scale. There's so much fire in the film. There's the fireplaces, there's the, the bonfire, there's all these explosions, there's the church burning, there's matches, there's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of fire. So what we did was we emulated that approach. So instead of it being a, a, a traditional fire sim, you know, it's not a pyro sim in Houdini, in Houdini or anything like that, it's a cloth sim. So we actually built geometry of pieces of cheesecloth and you can actually see, you know, the, the, the gridding in the cloth um, and it, it's wrapped around kind of simulated wire and we ran it as a cloth sim to create the, the look that mimics exactly what they did practically. I assume it was quite difficult at the visual development stage to match the practical fire? Difficult is, is, is relative. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And what made it you know, not, not as difficult as you might think is that we had a target, right? Like we had a, a perfect visual target, right? And we, we knew we were trying to match a reference um, that had all these qualities with stop motion. I mean, you could identify exactly what they liked, um, you know, exactly how something was working. And you know, they, they fell in love with their test. So I think we, once we had a really clear target, which is, you know, then it becomes kind of easy and you just sort of do the fun path to, to get there. You also did a lot of water simulation with the ocean, the seashore, underwater shots. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The ocean we knew, um, you know, was going to be a, a major thing that was, that was on our plate. We needed to find a look for the ocean that was going to feel, you know, had a lot of scope and a lot of scale, but ultimately needed to fit into the, to the rest of the world. It, so it needed to look handcrafted. It needed to look as though, if you assume they had like a million years to shoot this film, all the time in the world, that they could have built this practically and done an ocean. We were sort of inspired. There was a short called, uh, called Two Balloons where what they did was they built, it's kind of a cellophane surface and it had motion control plungers underneath. So it was like this kind of rubber sheet on top and this plungers like would go up and down underneath and create this, this wavy undulating surface. And we really, there was something intriguing about that, you know, about the way that it was handcrafted and, and tactile. Obviously, you know, they use it for, for wide shots and, you know, kind of boats going on in the background. We have a lot of interaction. So we have, you know, dogfish swimming around. We have, you know, they're kicking on a raft. They're splashing. Pinocchio's going up and down and bubbles are coming in. So it wasn't really a, a practical solution. We knew we were going to have to go into, you know, the world of digital simulation. But for the ultimate look, um, it was very inspiring. So what we ended up doing was, you know, we have a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a water simulation to kind of get the base um, wave motion, but then we post-process the, the mesh to remove any sort of lateral motions. The idea was that, you know, we wanted to build a surface that kind of had a texture baked onto it. So we would project displacement and textures straight down onto the water from above, and those textures would stick. So if you look at the, if you, you know, if you see the shots in the film, you know, that texture sticks and it waves up and down, but the texture doesn't really move. You know, there's nothing that flows laterally. You know, that was really a key to, I think, finding the look. And then we have you know flip simulations in the water that allow the characters to pop up and down and, and create splashes. Um, there's a foam layer that goes on top of that, which is intended to sort of look like tiny little crystal beads. Theoretically, you could do practically. It would take a lot of time, but trying to get those sort of real world material feeling into the water was something we we're, were really trying to do on purpose. And what about the underwater shots? Because they are also uh, the texture of the water, little things uh, floating around and, and so on. When you're underwater, the surface looking up is the same simulation. So it's the, it's the exact same uh, as, the, as the surface from above, just with everything flipped around underneath. There's a lot of compositing work to, to get the fall off and the murkiness working. So a lot of depth haze and, and buildup. Um, we would have the, the mines, so the naval mines that are underwater or on chains would be you know, placed in the distance, usually on cards. We could project the mines in the background in Nuke. Um, any hero foreground mines or chains were done in 3D. Uh, so those are rendered uh, 3D objects. Yeah, there's particulate floating in the water. So, you know, a particulate pass of, you know, tiny little specks floating around just to help help give the depth. And for, for the seashore, was there anything technically difficult to, to achieve? The beach scene at the end of the film, um, 
So two things. One is you know just getting the the right lapping of the waves. So for the ocean, I um, was running a lot of simulations to to have the the water come up on the shore and recede. They really wanted to see it you know, kind of leaving a shiny residue on the beach, so you know the, the sand would get wet and retain a little shine as it rolls away. There was a lot of back and forth in terms of how active the ocean was, and it really had to do with the mood of the film at that point. You know, like where you know we didn't want it to be. It's not a raging ocean, but you needed to to see it to see it moving. Originally in the story and in our, our earliest tests, it was snowing on the beach. That whole beach scene was, was supposed to have a very light snow. Um, eventually it just, it just you know, took too much away from the story. It was, it was distracting and there was no real reason for it. And we pulled back on that um, to get rid of the snow. The other thing with the beach scene um, that was, I'd say more of a challenge was this, were the skies. Um, you know, we did all the skies in the film. Um, Danny Devereaux was our, our sky lead, um, and she did an amazing job kind of, you know, looking after all the skies, working directly with the art department to make sure that, you know, that we were in continuity, that we were, we were hitting the mood correctly and, you know, delivering on what the emotional impact of, of each scene needed to be. So at the end of the film, um, it's a transition too. So you kind of see the sunset throughout the film. So from the time, uh, you know, Pinocchio comes back from limbo and pops up, goes to rescue Geppetto, Geppetto washes up on the beach, and you know the sun is at a certain point, and then when he sees Pinocchio wash up and goes, um, and they they kind of revive him. There's like huge spoiler alerts. I'm telling, I'm giving away the end of the film now, but the you know the sky subtly transitions in terms of where the sun position is and the lighting and how that all works with the practical. And that was you know that was very intentional, and just because of the way stop motion is shot, which is completely out of order. Like the film was shot over three years, and you know shots were popping up completely randomly until we had, you know, it really wasn't until kind of, you know, two and a half years into the shooting that I would say we had a complete, you know, assembly of the edit of that final scene to be able to work in continuity with the skies. So once we had that set up, it was very much, you know, a, 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 pro a journey or process of establishing what the key skies would be, what the what those grades look like, how are we gonna work with the DI to achieve the final look, and really hitting the, the transition to get the skies dialed in so that every shot worked and the shots didn't bump. You have the wood sprite come back in and add her blue glow to the whole thing. So there was like a blue contamination on it, which had a whole feedback loop in terms of what that did to the, the oranges and the reds. And really just kind of laying it all out and making that work was a, you know, a fun challenge to, to get that working. Was there ever a discussion on whether to really do all the skies digitally or to do at least some of them with practical backgrounds? So very early on, there was a discussion about doing them practically. Um, I think, I think the, the earliest discussion was they knew they couldn't do every scene practically, but they were going to kind of shoot elements and feed us um, you know, uh, kind of clouds or, you know, silks lit in a certain way um, that we could use as elements to build it up. They really just ran out of time. And I think COVID was one of the factors in that was that it was one of the things that sort of hit the floor um, early on where they said, okay, we're going to have to scrap these elements. Can you guys handle it all digitally in post? Um, and we just kind of took it and, and ran from there. If you had to do it again right now, would, would you do it the same way? Because you could imagine, for example, to use something like your LED panels and uh, do the skies beforehand to display them during the shoot? Honestly, I mean, working with LED panels, they, they're great. However, you really have to know everything you want to do in advance. Um, like you really are committing to something like that. And I think, you know, just the way we worked and the way we, we dialed it in in post, um, we really needed that flexibility in post. Um, LED panels really lock you in to something that you know, you, you, you can't really get out of or change later. Although I will say we, you know, the whole movie was shot in layers. So I, I think if we were gonna shoot it, we would probably, you know, we might shoot an LED panel background, but it would be a separate element and we would composite it anyway. So hard to say, I mean, yeah, it's hard to set up, like the, the stages are, are, are pretty small, um, some of them, and you shoot the background kind of on a different location anyway. So, you know, you'd have green screen going and you'd have to put it together. So and I think our, our, the method that we, we chose to go was, was pretty solid. You also worked on several uh, digital environments, including uh, Limbo and the, and the dogfish. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, so the, the dogfish was the, you know, our, the biggest digital environment that we had in the film. Um, we knew that the, the interior was gonna have to be digital just because of the way, uh, A, the size 
and the scope of it. And just because it was so self-contained, like the way you shoot stop motion, um, you really need access to the set. And you see on these sets, they have like trap doors and you know places that the animators can go in and move it around, and move the character, move the puppets around. And I think building something totally self-contained with a ceiling like that would just you know be probably too prohibitive to to be able to do it. The other thing is you know the look that that we were really trying to go for was this kind of living, breathing entity inside um, that had you know, light coming in from outside. You could feel the subsurface scattering. You see like the, the animation in the blowholes. Everything is kind of jellyish and moving around. And it was just, you know, it, it was just too big of a task to build something like that in, in stop motion. So they did build, you know, all the, anywhere where there's critical contact, is, is built. So you know, there's, there's pieces of land where the, the characters walk on. There's a, a ship, you know, like Geppetto's boat is there inside. They built kind of half a lighthouse that we extended digitally upward. So just kind of, you know, joining in and extending the set from what was already there was, uh, was what we did. Limbo as well. So Limbo is the, uh, is the world of sand where, where, where Pinocchio goes when he dies, it's it's surrounded by these shelves. Um, you know, it's a kind of unlimited number of shelves with, with with hourglasses on the shelves. Um, every time Pinocchio dies, he has to wait a certain amount of time for the hourglass sand to run out before he can go back. So we have all these shelves. Uh, the shelves were originally intended to, to be practical. Um, they were gonna make them out of laser cut acrylic and turn out there was a, you know, by the time they got to, to building them, there was a material shortage of the acrylic because of, because, also because of COVID. So we, we went digital with that too. There's also a uh, kind of a domed ceiling. It's sort of like a planetarium, but with all these, you know, graphical elements um, sort of up in the sky. So that was that we always knew was going to go digital. And we built that kind of based on some practical pieces that they built and shot and layered together in Photoshop and animated them together. And that became a projection to use in all those shots in Limbo. I assume COVID also uh, had an impact on the way you worked uh, at the studio. Maybe you worked uh, from home uh, at some point? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, once COVID hit, uh, we went completely remote. Um, during the lockdown, no one was allowed to come to work, so we had to establish ways quickly of uh, being able to collaborate. You know, all of our servers were still up. We would, you know, use thin client, zero client, Teradici's to for all the artists to get to their workstations in the office. And we used Shotgun and Microsoft Teams to kind of collaborate and, and do dailies that way. And yeah, we you know kind of got through it and you know figured out a new way, a new way of working. Kind of, you know, part way through we were allowed to start coming back into the office, which was great because, you know, it's always great to go in and see everything on the big screen, collaborate in person. Um, you know, there's nothing like being able to discuss a shot <laughs> in person and, you know, understand that the person that you're speaking with understands the note and, you know, you definitely have that that sense of collaboration, which I think is is indispensable. You also did some uh, crowd shots with uh, many people in the streets uh, sharing uh, several sequences. How did you uh, approach them? The crowd shots, uh, primarily it was with the with the fascists. So once we get to um, the scenes where, where Mussolini comes to see the um, the performance, uh, there's some shots in the streets there with with crowds of fascists, um, and we also did the kids in the, the kind of the capture the flag sequence in the re-education center. There are a lot of kids running around in the background that we added on additional digital doubles. They built puppets practically uh, a few, and we we digitally scanned those. Uh, we lidar scanned them. We matched the textures and created digital doubles that kind of matched um, not only in terms of the of the look dev but the rigging as well. So, you know, we really analyzed the way that the puppets were assembled and all of our rigs were sort of one-to-one -one compatible with the, with the physical practical armatures. So, you know, we would get the schematics of how the, the joints were put together, you know, where the pivot points were, and those were matched exactly so that our puppets moved in exactly the same way, had the same range of motion of the real ones. And then we sort of took the, the, you know, the, the practical puppets that they built and you know, we take a head from that one, the body from that one, or this guy's hands, or squeeze his head, and just kind of make these variations of the adults and kids, so that we had sort of a library uh, of crowd to put in the background and, and animate with. Nice, quite interesting. Basically, you uh, did a digital rig matching a physical matching rig. Matching a physical rig, exactly. And we did that for all the characters as well. I mean, we we have not rendered in the film um, like a digital Pinocchio or Geppetto, but all the characters had. We scanned them. We had digital doubles of all of them um, in terms of their rigs and geometry because we needed them for interaction. So all the water scenes where the, the water is interacting and they're splashing and, and, and swimming and kicking around, those were perfectly match moved so that we could run the simulations um, with the water kicking up and, and splashing against them. So we had all those puppets and, and kind of scanned everything to, to do that. Was there any discussion about the artists who created the puppets uh, and the, the sets about 3D scanning? Because sometimes when there is 3D scanning on set, 
uh, on live action shoots. They can be a little, be a little bit reluctant to see their work uh, digitized, not knowing where it goes. There was a lot of trust. I mean, there's a high, you know, a high level of trust between them. We knew that they wanted to do everything practically. Like we were, it's funny because we we came into the show expecting to have to, you know, fix shots later for with with hero puppets. You know, we've worked with Guillermo before. There was, you know, we have the the GDT factor that is always something on our, on our minds, which is that, you know, he can come up with with a great idea at any point in the production process. We could be a week away from delivery and all of a sudden he's like, oh, I have an idea for this shot. We want to change this. I mean, it's reasonable within, you know, he knows what the, what the parameters are, but you know, we're prepared to, you know, to kind of hit and go after any idea that that comes up. So we sort of knew, and one of the things that he wanted to see um, from the very first day that we got into the project is, you know, he wanted to see us do a test of a digital Geppetto, um, kind of to do a, a Geppetto walk cycle that was indistinguishable from the practical puppet. And we had a practical one as reference, and we we did it. And as we were working through it, the the practical animation supervisor, you know, got wind of this test, and he was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa hang on, you guys aren't going to be animating Geppetto. This is this is going to all be us." And I think they did. They were a little nervous, and we're like, "Oh no, it's just for insurance, and it's just a you know, it was for us to kind of win the job too at that point." But I think once you know, we kind of got all on the same track, where we knew that they were going to do everything practically. You know, they're going to do as much practically as they could, and we really respected that. And it really wouldn't be unless there was a serious problem that came up with a shot, like, oh, here's a massive continuity error and the puppets are gone and we can't reshoot this, there's no way to do it, that we would have to come and save it digitally, but that really never happened. Interesting, so basically the idea was, uh, just like on uh, many uh, live action shooting today, you usually scan the actors so that if there's something wrong from an insurance point of yeah. view, okay, you can still try to create everything in post. Uh, you also worked on creating um, elements such as uh, rain and snow. Uh, how did you uh, create these? The rain um, is really very much kind of just falling off the practical. So they did do some practical rain, um, really just contact drops. So it that was enough to just sort of give us, you know, the look and the kind of the methodology we should follow in terms of matching into it. So, you know, have this, you have the scenes where, for example, Cricket is in the hole in the tree and he's kind of poking out and watching Geppetto start to chop it down. And, you know, they would do practical drops with, you know, with, with glycerin that kind of, you know, drips down the tree trunk or collects on Cricket's elbow and then, and then falls off. And really that gave us enough to go on to design, you know, a drop, which was, you know, intentionally made to look like a, you know, a cartoony sort of physical drop with, you know, it was a little bit, you know, heavier and wider at the bottom, and these shards just drop down. I mean, one of the, the other things, uh, you know, that made it a little bit easier that we had going for us was the lack of motion blur. Um, because we were matching into stop motion, um, you know, we didn't have to worry too much about rendering motion blur with the effects because it would just take you out of, you know, the, 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 the aesthetic of the, of the stop motion doesn't have any of that. Um, it would be an immediate giveaway. Um, occasionally, they would do it in stop motion, you know, kind of do either go motion, hit the puppet a little bit during the exposure, or, you know, what, what is kind of fascinating, they would, they would build um, motion blurred pieces that were, you know, for example, like if Geppetto's swinging an ax, um, the frame right when he's swinging it that would, you know, typically be motion blurred, they would build an ax that was, that was wide, right? And just for one frame, they would swap out that one frame with a wide little cellophane ax um, that had motion blur and a little bit of transparency in it, even when you're just looking at it statically. So we'd use it sparingly when we needed, um, but really for the rain, um, you know, you'd have this, just these dropping shards that sort of had the, the blur built in just in the length of the drop itself. So you'd have these long drops that we built um, that would then be rendered without motion blur, but would sort of appear to have a blur just because they're, they're so long. So that was kind of the rain that we, that we matched into. And then similar take for the snow. Um, you know, the, the set was dressed with kind of white fluffy snow on the ground. So we knew kind of the color and the, the texture and the feel that we had to match into and then built flakes. And it was just a matter of, you know, what's the right scale, what's the right size of the flake, getting the right whimsical motion, which, you know, would depend on the, the emotion of the scene and, you know, how, you know, how stormy we wanted it to be. Um, Guillermo also always wanted for rain and snow to have interaction with the characters. Um, so you'd have drops that hit hit them, uh, you know, he'd always look at a scene and say, okay, now just add, add a few more drops there. Have one hitting his hat, have one hitting his shoulder, 
um, you know, have a flake that just lands on his jacket and melts away. So, you know, we'd go in afterwards and, and add that kind of stuff in. Can you tell us a little bit about the cleanup process? Because obviously sure. there was a lot of uh, wire and rig removal. Oh, yeah. Every shot, I would have to say, would, you know, has a rig in it holding the, holding the puppets up. And that's just the nature of stop motion. You kind of know that you're going in and you're going to have to do that. As puppets run, like just to kind of carry the weight, they have to be held on a rig. And that rig is going to be in the shot and you see it. So, you know, every shot has some amount of rig removal. Uh, every shot has a clean plate shot for it. Access panels, as I mentioned before, so you might have a, a set that's on a tabletop, but for the animators to be able to get in, you have to kind of cut away half the set because the animator is, you know, constantly popping up and down. Uh, and then you replace the panel, shoot the clean plate, and then have to go in and, digi and digitally replace the, the hole and put it all back together. Face chatter was another thing. Is that, like the way we built the, the puppets is a very traditional way, which is, you know, metal armatures with a silicone coating on top. And there's, you know, little controls, like lip controls and eye controls, so that the animators can really get in and hit the expressions. Um, you know, that's opposed to the kind of the more modern way, which is the replacement technique, where you have, you know, rapid prototype or 3D printed, you know, mouth shapes and eye shapes, and you just kind of pull it out and stick it in. And, it, you know, every frame is, is popping on and off little face pieces. Pinocchio was the only character we did that for. So every other character was kind of this, this traditional way. Pinocchio, you know, because he's basically, he, you know, he's, he's naked, right? And he's, he's, he's hard surface, he's naked. And his construction sort of lends himself to being the armature. Like you get to see the guts of the rig in looking at Pinocchio itself. Um, it's really like an amazing thing that they, that they engineered. It took him like a year to, to figure this out and make it. But Pinocchio's head was replacement. So as, he, as Pinocchio spoke, you know, they'd pull off his face and put on a new face to get the right mouth shape. So what that what that meant is, you know, because it was, you know, it was a difficult task to paint every every head exactly the same, as he speaks, you get subtle little popping because you know, he had kind of this wood grain painted over his face. So if you see some of the shots, we clean most of it up. But if you see some of the if you ever get to see the, the raw takes, the you know his face is flickering as he's speaking and we need to go and clean stuff like that up. There was always a debate though about charm. And this was like, the, the charm debate was, was a, you know, a topic that was always top of mind when we were creating the film. And charm, we sort of define charm as, you know, artifacts that are inherent to the stop motion process that, you know, sort of show that it's handcrafted and a, and a person has actually touched this, um, that it's not pristine CG and it's not, you know, it's, it's not too clean. But it's stuff that you might think, oh, we have to clean this up digitally. Like this is an artifact, we have to get rid of this. But it's things that we want to retain. And we say, oh, you know what? Maybe we only clean up 80% of this. Like let's keep a little bit just to show that, you know, a person was here, you know, and, and touched this. And, and, and it really is this, this live action handcrafted feel. So when we clean things up, obviously things like rigs have to go away, right? Things, you know, <laughs> where it totally betrays the illusion. But things that like, like the face chatter or just subtle, you know, like grass, grass that just kind of, you know, shifts frame to frame because, you know, something, some moisture in the, in the air in the studio changed and, and you know, things subtly moved. Um, those things we would keep and we, you know, we'd always look at them and be like, okay, is that, is that a fix or is that charming? <laughs> and it was like, we never really knew until you look at, you know, it was, it made it difficult to plan for, you know, it was an impossible thing to, to sort of budget for in advance um, because you really only ever knew once you, you kind of watched the take and dailies after you shot it. You never knew what was gonna, what you're gonna get. The movie relies on um, step animation. Did this affect some of your work? Maybe the simulation? You mean because they shot it like on twos? Yeah. You know, normally you shoot, you know, a film is 24 frames per second. Um, the animation was done, by and large, on twos, where they would, you know, hold a frame, shoot a frame, hold a frame. So effectively, it's about 12 frames per second. But it's not a hard and fast rule. So you know, if if it needs more frames, they would do more frames. So so in fast motion, you might go, you know, within a shot have a character on twos and then switches to ones and then switches back to twos. You might have like, you know, the lip sync on ones and the arm on twos or the arm goes, you know, if, if he does a fast motion with his hand, the arm goes on ones, but other things are, are, are held in place. So it made it really tr tricky because we had to match move everything, especially in the, in the water shots or shots where we had simulations. You know, you couldn't do just a typical match. You really had to have a keyframe on every single frame to, to hold it in place and make sure you were you were locked in to, to the motion. That does present a problem for simulations. So you, you then try to run a, a water sim on top of something that's like start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, and simulation kind of freaks out. Um, so yeah, we did have to counter that, you know, find ways of, you know, okay, now we smooth out the curve, run the sim, and then put it back on twos, 
and then render it with the holdout with the actual puppet being on choose. So yeah, there was there was some some figuring out there in terms of the frame rate. Overall, most of your work won't be perceived as VFX by the viewers. As an artist, how do you feel about it? We're used to that. Um, I mean, nine times out of ten, you know, in the in the, in the type of work that. Um, you know, MPC Toronto and Mr. X before it has, has done, if you can't tell that it's a visual effect, then we've done our job. You know, unless it's like, it's a creature or, you know, something, a spaceship, something, you know, really obvious that, that they could not have shot practically. You know, we're trying to hide what we do. We're trying to make it as though, you know, like the, the director has a vision in their mind of what they want the shot to be. And it doesn't matter how they, they get it. And if we can hide it or, you know, have the viewer trying to guess, you know, how, the, how it was done, then, then that's great. We've, we've done our job. And I think we're happy to be behind the scenes. It's nice to get, you know, recognition when, we, when, we ha when, when, when it's available, but certainly you don't want to be called out for obvious visual effects because um, then we haven't really done, it, done the job. As you said, you worked on many movies with Guillermo del Toro. What are you the most proud of? If you look back at all what you did with him. Uh, I mean, there's so many, it's, this is years now, but I mean, I mean, one shot that does stick out, you know, something that, that's, there was a you know a huge accomplishment. I'd say the, the opening shot in in Shape of Water, where we're kind of underwater, and, and there's an extended version of that shot that I don't think is in the final cut of the film. Um, I think they I think they actually just released it after, and we did it for a for a trailer, and then the the extended version I don't think actually made it in to the final film. But it's kind of like creeping along the bottom of the ocean through the water, and there's seaweed and there's fish, and we go in, you kind of go into the house. That was a lot of work, um, and I think you know a lot of that underwater stuff you know, paves the way for, you know, a lot of the visual things that we're seeing underwater in Pinocchio. It's funny, like, Guillermo's work always kind of works together. Like, he'll say now about Pinocchio that um, Pan's Labyrinth, uh, Pinocchio, and Devil's Backbone are kind of a, a, a trilogy. And if you, if you watch them together, there are definitely, you know, visual themes that, that, are, that, that come up. For example, the, the bomb dropping in Pinocchio is, you know, taken right out of Devil's Backbone. Like, he just said, here, go watch, watch this shot. That's what I want, you know, and we kind of mim mimicked it. The, the eyeballs on the wings of the wood sprite and the death character in Pinocchio are very similar to the, the wings in Hellboy. So there, there are a lot of visual uh, similarities in, in his work, and it's, it's just a lot of fun to do because, you know, he's definitely got these, these images in, in, his, in his head that you know there's a target to hit. You worked a few years ago on uh, Tron Legacy, yes. and also you worked on uh, Silent Hill. Yeah. Both these movies are getting sequels. Mm -hmm. I know that both were called back to work on the code in Matrix Revolutions. Would you like to work on these sequels? And if you were to work on these sequels, what would be the mindset? What would you like to do? Both of those films were, were great to work on. Uh, Silent Hill was a lot of fun. Um, you know, we did kind of a lot of work with the, the ash look and the roaches specifically, the, you know, that was our, our contribution in that film where the, the roach sequence. Um, we developed a lot of technology to be able to do the roaches. This was years ago. This was like, what, 2006, 2005, something like that. So yeah, I mean, I, you know, we'd love to go back to that world. I mean, it's, it's, it, was, it was very visually rich and you know, working with, uh, with Christoph was, was, was great. Tron is also a lot of fun. I mean, for, for me, working on Tron was, you know, a, a dream come true. I mean, I grew up with Tron, with the original. I remember, like, you know, renting Tron from the library on 16 millimeter, and we would, you know, set up the projector and just watch, watch that film. Um, I was, you know, just fascinated with how it was done. I was in love with the video game. You know, getting to go back to that world was just a, a bit of a dream come true. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to go there again, I'm game. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a lot of fun. I mean, there's just so many opportunities for design. It's really about, you know, building the world, um, and you get to control. You know, in 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 you know the same way as Pinocchio or any animated feature. Really, you know, the the great thing is you're in control of every detail of the world, um, and it's that sort of you know world building from the ground up to say like, yeah, here's how we're going to design everything. It's going to be a consistent look. I remember on the on the Tron Legacy, you know, there was a, a design. Um, sort of ethos about the shapes and the angles that were used. You know, everything was hexagons. Everything was like 30 degrees, 60 degrees. You know, there were no right angles in the world. You know, it's like, uh, that's great. You get to design that and make that sort of creative decision. Whereas, you know, if you're going to take your camera out in the world and shoot live action, it's like you're at the mercy of, of your location. Um, you can design certain aspects, but, you know, really to be able to, to control a, a, a world 100%, um, you have to sort of do like a, a film like that.